Hello, welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. Uh, this week, it's just going to be me and you uh, talking about transportation spend management. Uh, you know, a topic that uh, you know never seems to go out of style. Uh, certainly, uh, tends to uh, be a, a hot topic of conversation when when the when the economy is uh, uh, is down and companies are looking for ways to uh, you know cut costs and find cost saving opportunities. But uh, it's uh, you know a topic that companies should be looking at all the time, regardless of uh, economic conditions. And it's just good uh, best practice to really you know take a step back and and basically ask a very basic question: Are we spending uh, our transportation dollars as effectively as possible? Um, just a reminder: If you want to ask uh, any questions uh, during the program, you can uh, hit the submit a question button, and I'll uh, you know take a look at it. Um, you know, this is a topic that I, I first wrote about a few years back, uh, you know, particularly when the uh, the recession first hit and, you know, a, a lot of companies were really looking for ways to, uh, you know, find cost saving opportunities. And, and because transportation is, uh, you, you know, for a lot of companies, a large percentage of their, of their logistics cost uh, or of their, uh, uh, you know, COGS, um, you know, it becomes a natural target to kind of take a look at and see, you know, what cost saving opportunities there are. Uh, and certainly, you know, back in, you know, 2008 timeframe, the first half of the year when we were seeing uh, fuel prices, uh, you know, increase, um, you know, where oil was reaching $150 a barrel and, and people's uh, uh, transportation budgets were getting blown out of the water. Uh, that became another area, you know, another time where a lot of companies really started looking at, at the transportation operations, looking to see, you know, if there are opportunities to be you know, more effective in terms of the way they're managing their operation, in terms of their, the way they're spending their transportation dollars. Um, you know, and, and so what I want to do today is really focus on five, you know, basic questions that, you know, every transportation executive ought to be asking themselves. Um, and, and if you're not asking it of yourself, uh, I'm sure your CFO will be asking it, uh, you know, of you. And, you know, while the questions may sound simple, and they may sound kind of common sense, um, it's surprising to me still in this day and age that a, a lot of companies still uh, are kind of falling short in, in, in putting together some of these best practices or common sense practices um, that, uh, you know, could save you, you know, significant money um, if you were, um, you know, compliant and, and really vigilant around these things. You know, a few, uh, a few weeks back, I wrote a, a, a blog posting talking about innovation and how, you know, there's so much buzz and hype around innovation, but that companies can, you know, arguably achieve as great benefits and, and uh, you know, opportunities by focusing on execution. And, and this is really one of those areas, transportation spend management, that's really all about execution and really focusing on some fundamental, you know, best practices that really apply, you know, whether the economy is up or down, um, whether it's a constrained market or, or uh, you know, a, a shipper's market, it really doesn't matter. I think if you focus on these five questions, and then obviously, if you've got the technology and the people, um, you know, to really uh, answer those questions effectively, I, I think you'll be in uh, good shape. So let me let me get to the uh, kind of the first question here. Again, this one is, seems, you know, kind of a, a basic one, but the question is: Are you leveraging a total transportation spend uh, when negotiating carriers, or you know, is your spend, you know, fragmented across, you know, departments, business units, or three PLs? And you you know, this is a Again, a common sense question, but what I often find, particularly with companies that have grown through mergers and acquisitions, is that the left hand sometimes doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So you have got uh, you know two different business units, for example, so two different groups that are working with the uh, the same 3PL, um, but they've got completely separate contracts. They've got completely separate negotiated rates with carriers. Um, so they're not really leveraging their total business vo volume, their total transportation volume. When you know working with these 3PLs or you know transportation providers, um, and uh, you know again missing out on opportunities there to really uh, aggregate their spend and be able to uh, you know negotiate with more power or be able to present the carrier or the 3PL with a more holistic business opportunity and and find you know ways that they can work you know together in, in a more strategic way and in a more cost effective way. Uh, you know, for both parties, because now you're, you're, um, you know, you're leveraging your business, you know, across multiple lanes, across, again, mul multiple products, you know, so on and so forth. Now, of course, there are cases where, uh, you know, some of the business units may have completely different products that may not be leverageable, 
um, because you may need different equipment or you may have completely different lanes or things like that. But in a lot of cases, um, you know, what I've seen is that companies are leaving money on the table because, uh, again, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And, um, you know, they're missing out on opportunities for, to consolidate loads, uh, to provide backhauls for, uh, you know, some of the carriers they're working with uh, and, and things like that. So really taking a look at your, your network, taking a step back and creating a baseline is really the first step. Is trying to understand, you know, what are all your lanes um, and, and, and flows across all your business units, right? So doing a, a network design uh, engagement to understand that. Understanding all the carriers you're working with and how you're working with, uh, you know, how you're working with them. Um, to see where there are overlaps and lanes, overlap and carrier bases, perhaps where uh, you, you've got different divisions. Um, and I think when you when you do that, you will undoubtedly find opportunities, um, you know, to save some money uh, again by leveraging your your spend, you know, more effectively. Again, this happens in other parts of procurement um, in terms of um, uh, you know whether you're procuring uh, uh, widgets or, or or indirect materials. Um, you know, you see a lot of the procurement departments really looking to leverage or spend. The same applies, you know, with, with transportation. So basic question, are you leveraging your spend as effective, your total spend as effectively as possible across your business units, across your carriers, across the three PLs that you're, you're working with? The second question is, are you engaged with the right set of carriers? Or are you, you know, are there other carriers out there that you might, you could be working with that could provide you know, similar or better service at a, at a lower cost. Um, you know, this is a challenge for a lot of companies because uh, they tend to, um, you know, only know the universe of, of, of carriers that they've always worked with. Um, and, you know, for a lot of companies, you know, those core carriers will always remain an important part of, of, your, uh, uh, of your transportation spend and of your, um, uh, of your network. But there are times where perhaps you've got a new customer or you're um, uh, entering new markets and you really need to know, uh, you're look, really looking to expand your, the pool of carriers you work with or, or need to find new carriers in some of these lanes. And the question becomes is, you know, how do we find these carriers? Um, you know, historically, this has been an area where, you know, consultants that have helped companies with, you know, procurement engagements, you know, bring their knowledge to the table in terms of the, you know, local carriers, uh, you know, they're experiencing working with other shippers in terms of, uh, you know, recommending to that shipper other carriers that they may want to invite, you know, as part of the procurement process, um, you know, and take a look at, um, you know, to participate in, in the bid. And then obviously in terms of the right carriers, you want to look at, you know, their insurance levels, their financial stability, um, their driver safety, uh, and of course IT, as I've mentioned in, in previous episodes, IT is becoming you know, a critical success factor these days in terms of a carrier's ability to provide you with, you know, timely and accurate uh, information. So f having as, as great a visibility into all the different carriers that um, serve the, the lanes that you operate in and being able to find potentially new carriers that, again, have a good service record, meet all of your, you know, requirements, but perhaps you, they ha you haven't worked with them uh, before, um, but it, it, they might be worthwhile to consider. Uh, this is one of those areas uh, that, you know, software as a service or network-based transportation management systems have also, uh, you know, provided some benefit. Uh, I've always been a big uh, proponent of uh, uh, SaaS TMS solutions because of kind of the, the value that the network brings. And again, uh, what the network provider, what the SaaS TMS provider is able to do is because they've got thousands of carriers on their network, um, they're able to showcase different carriers that have strong lanes on the, car on the lanes that you work with. Um, they could even show you carriers that, um, you know, might be looking for backhaul opportunities that align well with your network. Um, and again, being able to introduce you to new carriers is um, uh, that, again, would be ideal, be a nice fit with what you're looking for uh, is a great benefit. So again, finding the right carriers, looking for not only, you know, obviously continuing your partnerships with those carriers that have proven to be good partners, uh, both in good times and not so good times and pr provide, you know, consistent and reliable service, but also being able to find, uh, you know, carriers that are, um, you know, can uh, provide some value in lanes that you don't have enough coverage in or in new lanes that you're, you know, uh, need, need to get coverage for, um, I think is, is critically important. And that, again, presents another opportunity perhaps to find some cost savings 
by working with new by identifying and working with new carriers uh, that meet all of your requirements. The third question, and this is one that I see all the time happening, and it's a challenge for many companies, is are you consistently using contracted uh, carriers and playing contracted rates, or is there a lot of maverick you know spending going on? And this is one of those areas where you know again a transportation management system can help. But for a lot of companies, uh, particularly those that have very decentralized, um, you know, operations um, where they may have negotiated, you know, some rates with, uh, with, with carriers, but, you know, Bob in our, uh, you know, uh, uh, Boston, D.C., you know, he's friends with X, you know, Joe the carrier, and it doesn't really matter what the, what the uh, uh, routing guide says. He's always going to go with Joe the carrier because he's been working with Joe for, for many years, even though, you know, even though Joe might be providing some good service, you know, he's, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent above what the negotiated w w uh, rate was, you know, that that was um, uh, negotiated by procurement. So being able to have visibility to make sure that uh, all of your shipping locations are compliant with the routing guide, that they're using your preferred carriers that you've negotiated rates with and capacity with um, is critically important. Um, and for a lot of companies, again, that's an area where they see leakage in kind of the, the planned transportation savings because you know when you do a procurement bid at the end of the day it's just really planned uh, savings uh, you then have to go and execute it on it and even though on paper it says you're, you're going to save 10 percent this year on uh, on your on your transportation at the end of the year you you, you realize you only saved you know six percent or five percent and when you peel back the onion uh, for a lot of companies really part of the root cause is that uh, you know you, you see maverick spending going on or number two you know, your preferred carrier, your number one and number two carriers keeps rejecting, you know, the load. So their tender, accept rate, tender acceptance rate is, uh, is lower than, um, than you had contracted for, you had agreed to. Uh, so keeping an eye on that, you know, making sure that you are maximizing the number of loads uh, that are going with your preferred carriers that are going under your contracted rates is, uh, again, another one of these areas that, again, sounds, uh, sounds like common sense, sounds trivial. Uh, but it's an area that a lot of companies struggle with, uh, particularly those that have, don't use a TMS or don't have any kind of technology to really have that visibility, um, uh, particularly those that have a decentralized operations to what each of their shipping locations are doing. Um, and that's really one of the benefits of, you know, having a TMS in place. Or, you know, some companies that I know I've talked about earlier this year about putting in, you know, uh, control towers. Um, that's another, you know, benefit there to have that you know, visibility across all different locations so you can see when those exceptions are taking place and take some corrective, uh, take some corrective action. Uh, question number four is, are you being invoiced correctly? And what is the cost of your freight, you know, settlement process? Um, you know, for a lot of companies, historically, um, managing, you know, the invoicing and, you know, freight payment process was prohibitively expensive. Um, you know, so a lot of companies ended up outsourcing that function um, because it was just a lot of manual uh, intervention, a lot of overhead involved with that. Um, what I started seeing a few years ago is because TMS vendors really started improving their capabilities around, you know, freight audit and payment is that some companies started to bring that back because they were now able to automate it internally and, um, you know, be able to do it as effectively, even more cost effectively than a third party provider could. Um, because they already had the rates in the system. They already saw what happened on the execution side. They can do the match and pay. Um, since all the data, again, was in the, in the TMS, it was easier for, it was easier now because of the capabilities that uh, TMS vendors had added, you know, to bring that operation, you know, back in-house. Uh, again, uh, you see a lot of examples here where, uh, you know, companies are, are, are invoiced twice for the same shipment or accessorials are, are not charged correctly. Uh, so on and so forth. So being able to, um, uh, you know, catch those discrepancies, be able to correct them, and be able to automate the process um, are all opportunities for companies to save money on on their transportation. You know, one of the one of the great examples I, I've seen across the um, uh, across the years, particularly on the parcel shipping side, where you know a lot of companies um, get charged for a lot of these different accessorials, such as address correction fees or, um, you know, being charged for a residential address when really it is a business address and things like that. And because these are, you know, relatively speaking, you know, a dime here, a quarter there, a dollar there, 
um, you know, the individually, each of those surcharges are relatively small, but if you're a high volume shipper, those things add up. And sometimes without technology, without um, being able to effectively audit that, um, you know, all those things add up over time. And, um, you know, companies that have, again, put the processes in place, put the technology in place, are able to really fix those errors, fix those, those uh, 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 overcharges and so forth, and be able to you know, recuperate a lot of um, you know, money uh, in the process. And then finally, the last question is, are your transportation costs aligned with the rest of the market? And this is one of those areas that you know, has always been a challenge you know, for transportation managers. Is, you, know, you can always, you, you know, it's easy to see how you're doing relative to last year. Uh, it's easy to see how you're doing with your transportation spend relative to what you budgeted for this year. What's difficult is, you know, well, how are we doing, um, you know, relative to our peers in the market, relative to some external uh, benchmark? Uh, and again, this was an area where, you know, companies, you know, have worked with consultants to get some third-party benchmarking data to help them out. Um, but what we've seen in recent years has been the, the integration of, of uh, this benchmarking data within the TMS itself. Um, so that you can keep a pulse on uh, what's happening in the market relative to your current rates, um, be able to leverage that data during procurement events, um, and you know the bottom line being is that companies today, because of third-party services, because of you know the inherent nature of of SaaS TMS and network-based TMS is collecting a lot of data and is able to take that data, run it through you know develop a model and be able to provide some some indexes or some benchmark data back to its users, it's it's easy. It's a little bit easier for companies to at least get a feel for how they're doing in terms of rates and service relative to some external benchmarks, and then be able to identify those lanes or those carriers that are you know are the exceptions uh, or there might be problem areas, and then go and um, you know do a a, a spot procurement uh, or targeted procurement engagement you know to realign those parts of the transportation network. So again, those are my five questions that I think are, are important for every transportation uh, executive to ask themselves, um, to really look and see if you've got the technology, the people, and the processes in place to effectively answer them. And uh, again, it, it really doesn't take much um, uh, uh, to really, again, tighten those processes, um, and you'll be able to find some uh, significant, potentially significant, you know, cost benefits, um, you, you know, without, you know, making he, a, additional huge investments in technology or, you know, in, in people. Um, you know, again, it goes back down to execution. Are you executing on these fundamental, you know, best practices that, you know, every company ought to be, uh, you know, looking at? You know, I'll leave you with one example that I, I it still surprised me to this day, and this was back in, uh, again, 2008 timeframe where um, as the price of oil was escalating and this company, this is a multi-billion dollar company, the CFO went to the transportation manager and said, you know, why, what's going on with transportation? Why are, you know, why is our budget, you know, really out of whack? And obviously oil, the price of oil was one factor, but as they really started peeling back the onion and looking, you know, kind of looking at the transportation spend, one of the things that they discovered was that on the ocean side, they were actually paying paper rates for the past eight years. So their contracts had expired back in 2000, and those contracts were in someone's uh, office, paper-based, in a drawer somewhere, and they expired, and they defaulted to, again, market rates, and they have been paying that for the past eight years, uh, unbeknownst to anybody. And again, because time, the economy was relatively good, um, you know, and, and the company was doing relatively well, um, it kind of got overshadowed, but it wasn't until, uh, you know, things started getting tough with the economy and the, the company started getting concerned about performance and they started really looking at areas that they can improve on that they found that. And again, you can say, how can a multi-billion dollar company uh, be operating, you know, paying paper rates for the past eight years and not know about it? Well, the sad truth is that um, it happens every day. And it goes back to my point that, a lot of companies, you know, they, they, they're, they're looking at the next new shiny thing and not really focusing on some of the fundamentals, and they're leaving a lot of money on the table uh, as a result. And again, these five questions I presented, basic common sense questions, but they're questions that should be asked all the time, and um, 
promises to provide some significant benefits if uh, you're falling short on them. So again, thank you very much for uh, joining the program today. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments about uh, this topic, uh, feel free to go to the uh, Talking Logistics uh, website, TalkingLogistics.com, uh, find this episode and you know, post a question or a comment. I'll be happy to, um, you know, to answer it. And uh, be sure to you know, tune in in the coming weeks where we have some great guests uh, lined up and um, you know, we'll have some great conversations around uh, some additional you know, trends and uh, uh, topics that are top of mind for supply chain logistics executives in the industry. So again, thank you very much for joining and uh, have a great day.